welcome to everyone. I'm pleased um, um, to welcome Preeti Raj Singh uh, to have a very, um, what promises to be a very exciting talk today. Um, thank you um, also um, to the audience for coming and um, attending this talk. Um, this is part of our lecture series, Resilience, Historic Houses of India and Their Custodians. It's also part of our knowledge transfer um, initiative. Um, to uh, give the word to owners of historic houses um, so that we have this kind of direct first-hand account of historic houses and wonderful stories that we wouldn't normally find in, in, in history books. So let me just um, start and please I also uh, always like to say that uh, we like to uh, have a very interactive session so please use the chat option um, to introduce yourself, to make comments, to to ask questions. If you have a question, please kindly um, uh, type Q in front of the question that will be um, easier for us to find it. Um, so. um, as always, I like to try to start by picking a theme um, for um, today's lecture. And if you've seen the first image, let me just go back um, one moment. You see that this, this is the house we're going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> Mohan Nivas Palace in Pana. So if you look at this house, um, to what extent is this Indian? Or you know, what does it look like? What kind of style is used? And actually, I would like to ask these questions and um, hope that Preet Viraj uh, will also uh, make a few comments about this. And um, this has an unusual story because it is in a way a souvenir from a trip um, from a family who loved to travel. And um, very often in current debates, especially in kind of post-colonial um, theory, um, you have the idea, and I've heard it many times, that somehow the style has been dictated um, or been imposed from above. Um, if you kind of follow this argument, um, there is a problem with the fact because somehow you take away the agency of people. You somehow assume that people are just kind of mindless puppets listening to someone. And I think from, you know, looking at the reality, it is quite different. And I would like to give this example here. Um, the first image that you can see is actually Wadsden Manor um, in Buckinghamshire in the UK. But what you see doesn't really look very British at all. And you know, everyone who saw it um, thought it must have been you know, very un-English. It was built by Lord Rothschild. And the Rothschild family loved French style. We also know the term guru child uh, to describe this kind of opulent style and many French elements in interiors um, as well. And uh, below there, you see another building that looks French, but this is actually in India. And it's, it's Jagsit um, 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 Palace, uh, built by the Maharaja of Kaputala. And somehow, you know, why did they choose the style? Um, could they maybe just like it? Or was it an example of being cosmopolitan, of being able to travel and being inspired by it? And of course, this is a very, you know, has a very long history. The idea of travel, bringing souvenirs, and the souvenirs of whatever you see kind of um, have an impact on, on architecture and interiors as well. So one example, for instance, is this picture on the left which is in Wurlitz. It's a beautiful 18th century landscape garden with a beautiful English country house style uh, palace in, 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 the, in the park. And what you see here is an artificial volcano. And it's a rather clever kind of construct because it really can erupt. And they, they still do it a few times, you know, um, um, ever so often. And what you also see is the Hamilton Villa because uh, the Duke traveled um, to Italy and it was of course part of the uh, grand tour to spend time in, in abroad and in, in, in study classical art and architecture. And the result could be something like this. Or the result could be something like this that you see here on the right. It's a print room and basically these were souvenirs, um, you know, uh, etchings or something that you would bring from a trip and um, it's a kind of do-it-yourself project where you would in an up park actually in the UK. So I'd like to use that idea of um, being inspired by something and influences of architecture on, um, um, you know, on in the family who were also patrons of the arts and architecture. And maybe Preeti Raj, you could tell us a little bit more and show us um, some images uh, about this idea. So today we are talking um, about Mohan Nivas Palace, which is in Pana. 
And here um, I've, uh, I've, I've got a map um, of, um, of Pana, and you see that this is part of the Bundelkhand region. Um, these were also Rajputs, and I think Prithvi Raj will talk about the family history in, in detail. And there are also, you know, as always, many different uh, stories about the origin of the uh, Bundelkhand family. But, uh, you know, like many um, interesting, fascinating historic houses in India, there's also the story of love and, uh, you know, um, unhappy love, problematic love, falling in love with the wrong person. So one story of the origin is also that the name uh, actually comes um, um, originally from a Rajput who married outside of the caste and fell in love uh, with a slave girl. And I think a similar name, you know, their son then was, um, you know, was called um, a Bundel or something like this. And this is where the, or Bundel, or this is where the uh, kind of uh, name comes from. This is just one of the stories. Prithvi Raj will tell you more about it. And uh, when you look at this, you see some um, fascinating places and you see the origin of the history, which is closely linked with the Mughals. So here you see Gwalio, Jansi, um, um, and um, here, it, the uh, second map, I hope you can see it with the cursor. Um, so Datia, Orcha, these are amazing, um, you know, monuments. Um, and, uh, you know, these are part of the architectural heritage, which is quite different from the palace that we see today, um, but this is the origin. So here I've given you um, some images um, which are really stunning. This is Orcha, and um, this is a wonderful book um, about, um, uh, uh, the architecture uh, of uh, Orcha and, and Bundela. And we were supposed to have uh, the author here today, but unfortunately he uh, was in an accident and it's not life-threatening luckily, but he is not able to be here. So at a later stage, we would like to um, focus on the marvelous uh, architecture of um, Orcha and uh, some other um, you know, monuments of uh, the uh, Bundelkhand region. So here you see uh, the impressive architecture and um, you, know, you see the square plan here of the Govind Mandir Palace in Dartia and um, uh, also the Chhatris, uh, which have uh, inspired you know, also Sir Edwin Lutyens you know, for Rashtrapati Bhavan. And so we are talking about uh, the really interesting evolution of architecture in the uh, 17th century. This is just to give you an idea about the um, artwork also of that time. So this was probably created um, for one of the early descendants um, of the um, family, uh, Beer Singh Deo, I'll just have a short chronology that was probably uh, created um, for him. And this is just to give you an idea. So you really see that the family history um, of that region is kind of um, synchronous with the uh, Mughal um, rulers. So Orcha was founded in the early 16th century. There are different dates. I've seen 1531, I've seen 1501. Um, and this, you know, I, in, in bold, these are some of the really important people um, of um, the family. Raja Rudra Pratap and then Beer Singh Dio. And uh, so this is a kind of the typical kind of, uh, you know, conflict where sons wanted to take over from fathers and you know there was of course the um, you know the competition between the Mughals on the one hand you know you you were a courtier to the Mughals on the other hand you also wanted to break free and this kind of conflict kind of shaped this kind of area in the um, 16th and 17th century. Finally, Orcha was abandoned in, in 1783 because of continuous conflict both with the Ma um, Maharatas and the Jats. And this is the kind of area that we are uh, looking at. I just uh, wanted to show you this uh, beautiful um, um, image here, uh, which is at the Royal Collection Trust, showing um, how um, the uh, imperial forces are coming um, to, um, to invade um, Orcha. And this is now the beginning of uh, the uh, history of Panna uh, in the uh, 18th century. We'll hear more about it from Preet Viraj. And this is the map just so that we know, um, you know where, where we are here. 
I also wanted to show you some images from the 18th century to kind of illustrate what this landscape looked like, like. and so you really understand the context of where the new architecture that we are dealing with, which is an early 20th century uh, building, originated. So you have this kind of romantic um, landscape um, um, image here uh, with the you know, temple and a fortified building, hills, a beautiful landscape around it. And this is a, a, a fantastic um, image from the British Library. And it's the water tank and also pre Guriage, you will actually continue talking about this, always this correlation between water and, 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 and architecture, yes. And um, somehow this looks actually, you know, although this, uh, you know, was in the 18th century, somehow it's really kind of uh, almost, you know, a little bit, you know, of a, of a correlation between um, the building and, uh, and, and this kind of history. So. This is um, a fantastic photograph um, of a very famous um, photo photographer who took many photographs of historic monuments in the 19th century, some of the earliest uh, photographs that we know of. And again, uh, we have the lake. And now I wanted to show you some objects um, associated with the, uh, with the history, the family and, and the architecture. Uh, these uh, thrones, and uh, this is uh, really fantastic from the late 19th century. Here in the middle, in the back, you see the uh, family uh, coat of arms. And again, we'll hear a little bit more about it from, from Preet Viraj. And it's this kind of blend between European style and um, you know, Indian. This was made in Benares and um, it was uh, silver and then um, gilded as well. And you have some embossed aspects, you have some engraved aspects, and you have the embroidery here, which is, uh, which is Indian, you know, with a silver thread on the original um, upholstery. And here again, you know, some, some objects, you know, I wish we had some more objects, but I just wanted to show you uh, something um, from the period, um, uh, at the, uh, you know, before the 19th century, before the 20th century. This is one um, historic picture of one of the palaces in, 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 in Pana. And now I'd like to hand it over to Preet Viraj, please. Thank you. Um, Preet Viraj, are you able to, um, to screen share? Thank you so much, Professor, for this lovely introduction. And without further ado, I would like to share. This. Yes, Professor, I'm just working. Uh, professor, should I continue? With yes, please. Mm. I hope I'm audible, everyone. Yes, and, uh, without further ado, I'd like us. I'd like to take us to the Mohanwas Palace in Panna. So, right from where Professor left us, I'll just speak a little bit more about the coat of arms. So, the coat of arms of a Panna, uh, the state has eleven gun salute. Am I audible, everyone? Yes, it's perfect. So it's inspired from European heraldry. It features a shield decorated with a flower motif beneath the border of sable, which the lion and a bear supports. The significance of a people tree has a religious value. In Hindu religious text, in Rig Veda, it's considered as a god. In Atharva Veda, it's considered as home of gods. And in Yajur Veda, it's meant, that it's meant for every ceremony. Also represents the cycle of life and death. The lion and the bear are considered the protectors. The lion god is Narsimha which is to destroy evil and restore uh, dharma. And the bear is Jamvat, the Hindu mythological character, the god of sloth bears, which was created by Brahma to assist Rama to destroy evil. The motto literally translates as the lord of light, diamonds, is the protector of people. And here are some of the inherited buttons. Thank you, Raj, we able to see the presentation. You're not able to see the presentation. I'm so sorry, yes. Professor. Maybe IT can help. Yeah. It can sometimes happen. There can be a little now. I think now it's starting. Yes, it just happens from one um, screen share to another. Great. Thank you. 
So, uh, this is the story of Monnevas. And without further ado, I would just like to talk a little bit more about the coat of arms. It's inspired from the European heraldry and it features a shield with a flower motif in between and has two um, protectors, the lion and the bear. The lion is Narsimha avatar of the Hindu um, Lord Vishnu to destroy evil and restore dharma. The bear is Jamvat. One moment, please. It is not very clear. Which is the full screen. Yes, maybe the internet connection is a little bit off. Um, if you can go anywhere closer to the source. That but now this is a full screen. This is um, much better. If I may suggest, uh, right. if the internet connection is not so strong, we can switch off. Uh, Mr. Prithvi Raj, you can uh, switch off your video so that you know the internet consumption oh, can yeah. be managed for the slide and your audio. Uh, all right, sir. Uh, but I'm just screen sharing, so you can still switch off your camera even while you're screen sharing. All right. All right. Yes, so the coat of arms of Panna state and it also represents, the, so the people tree has a significant value with the Hindu religious text. So all the three texts of Hindu religious, um, the Rig Veda, the Atharva Veda and the Yajur Veda. So in Rig Veda, it's considered as a God. In Atharva Veda, it's considered as home of gods and in Yajur Veda, it's meant for every ceremony. This is the people tree right there. And uh, the two animals that, that are present there, it, it represents Lord Narsimha Avtar of Lord Vishnu and bear is the Jamvat. Both of them are protector of uh, protector and destroyer of evil. And uh, the Jamvat was created by Brahma to assist Rama to destroy evil. The motto Praja Shatra Vajresh literally translates as the Lord of Light Diamonds is the protector of people. Now let's move on to Maharaj Chhattisal, the founder of Bundelkhand dynasty. So there is a saying which goes, it's Jamna Utnarmada, it's Jambal Uttos, Chhattisal so laran ki rahi na kahu hos. So it literally translates as from Yamana to the north to Narmada in the south, from Chambal in the east to Tos in the west. No one within these walls had the courage to challenge Chhattisal. Maharaj Chhattisal was the youngest son to Champatrai. He was granted a Jagir from Orcha, but what is interesting about him is that he was the fourth and the youngest son of Maharaj Chhattisal. He started off with five, five army and throughout his reign, he engaged in voracious warfare against the provincial representation who were the center sole authority to the Mughals. This, con this brings us to the technical notion of a king who was also a Jagirda. And a code of conduct existed amongst Bundela that when they... Uh, am I audible? Yes, but it's a little choppy. I think it's the internet connection. Yes, Professor, I might... I'll just... Yeah. What I could also offer is I can share your presentation because I've got it here, uh, but still your voice needs to be audible. So last time we spoke, it was really perfect. If you could go back to the same source, that would be, that would be great. Am I audible now? Yes. Very good. So, um, apart from being a valiant warrior, he was the fourth son to Rao Raja Champatrai, and he was initially a Jagir Dar, a Bhumivat, and uh, a technical notion of a king who was initially a Jagir Dar. Uh, a code of conduct exist, code of conduct which existed that a Bundela house will not attack another Bundela house. So, over a period of time, uh, with his five valiant warriors. And eventually he led up to have the strongest army in all of Bundelkhand. And an, in, in, an interesting question arises that if he was a Jagirdar, was he already a subordinate to the house of Ocha? So, which brings us to a letter dated April 25th, 1721, 
and right here is the citations of it and the letter literally translated and he gave up his jagi to that uh, to the house of orcha after saying that when i have one and half territories from my own prowess why should i still have a jagi so uh, this tells us how he had already established bundelkhand now we'll focus on his lineage so his first wife and senior queen uh, gave birth to hardesha from where my mother hails and uh, the whole panna dynasty began hardesha was granted panna for governance and his second born uh, jagatraj was given the present ajaygarh state now let's move on to bajirao mastani so mastani was a persian uh, court dancer adopted from maharaj chatrasal as a child she was fluent in her movements and danced in the most poetic way possible as heard from my great grandmother when was she married to bajirao peshwa let's have a look at peshwa bajirao so this is when maharaj chatrasal was cornered by mohammad shah bangash and this was during his last um, years as a warrior jaitpur was the last bastion for the iconic bundela warrior and the nearby bundela kings of datiya and chanderi had refused to help so he writes a letter to peshwa bajira one which is now a part of popular folklore gati grah gajendr ki so gati bhai hai aaj baji jat bundel ki baji rakho laaj i am in the same plight in which the elephant king was when caught by the crocodile this bundela is on the brink of losing o baji rao come and save my honor so baji rao subsequently sent an army to aid chatrasal against the moguls and upon his death in 1731 the kingdom was divided amongst his son one third uh, going to mahoba banda jhansi going to his ally the maratha peshwa baji rao and a famous historian quoted that the relationship between the peshwa baji rao and maharaj chatrasal was that of like a father and son dj godse now moving on to 1857 His Highness Nirpat Singh Jadev, uh, who's helped, who's built a lot of construction, as shown by uh, the slides by uh, Professor, she had mentioned she shown a beautiful river, and then there was a small fort and everything. This is the Nirpat Saga that we're talking about. So Nirpat Singh Jadev uh, had helped the British Governor General during the 1857 uprising by holding on and fighting rebels at Damo. The kings later donated land required for the East Indian Railway and constructed Nirpat Sagar. Lokpal Sagar and Panna's High Street called uh, right now Bada Bazaar. He was also the person who started a mechanized way of the present diamond mines of Panna. This is a steep well constructed by Lokpal uh, His Highness Nirpat Singh Jadev, uh, named after his father, the Lokpal Sagar. And uh, what is really interesting about Panna is, despite being just Uh, in Bundelkhand, it is rich with history as well as wildlife. So this is the Ken River, which is the heart of uh, life of Panna. And uh, what's amazing about this is, like in all the banks, it has blessed many villages with diamonds. Now these are the diamond mines from. This is from the diamond mines of Panna. Let's have a look at this video. One can see it's exuberant and it's. totally raw and pure right from the diamond mines this is an uncut diamond now we'll have a look at the other diamonds this is a group of diamonds hand picked by the nmdc government uh, it's also called polki diamonds it's used for jewelry designs panna still continues to bless its inhabitants with a few discovery of diamonds within the boundaries of district panna So it's very common in Panna to uh, in the, like to just wake up in the morning and you know pick up the newspaper and see that so and so uh, found a diamond and now uh, he's looking forward to establishing his own business. Another he historical heritage site are the Pandav Falls. Legend has it during Mahabharata they lay hidden due, uh, in one of the exiles in Panna. These are some remnants of caves and shrine. a peculiar marvelous cave dug out inside one solid rock and this is panda falls another beautiful place is the panna tiger reserve surrounded by lakes and waterfalls and of course diamonds one cannot miss the king of the jungle panna is the only example where tiger relocation project after in 2008 when panna had zero tigers 
a tiger and a tigress was um, brought back to from bandhavgarh to panna and suddenly it revived uh, but the interesting fact is uh, like when the cubs were born they weren't from the ma- same male uh, of bandhavgarh so there was a ghost tiger and thankfully the panna genes is still present these are some of the landscape photographs by a dear friend naturalist he goes with the instagram handle as safari with rohit some of the landscape beautiful landscapes of panna and of course the big five this is just four the tiger leopard sloth bear and the hyena and of course uh, the remarkable crocodile of the ken river now let's move on to an extremely interesting story um his highness madhu singh the king who was exiled this is the mahindra bhavan constructed by his highness madhu singh till recently it was ser- serving as a district court of panna an interesting story of murder and how the present dynasty began rao raja khuman singh who was an uncle to his highness madhu singh was the only true sole authority when it came to dictate the darbar after madhu singh he was the youngest brother to lokpal singh and son of rudra pratap as a strong political figure in the bundelkhand empire little did he know that he would be the father of four kids who grow up to be governing panna and one in rajpipla so his highness madhu singh wanted to legitimize his relationship with kamal kuwar a court dancer born out of an illegitimate relationship between a guard and a priest an only reason an only person that was opposing this legitimacy of the panna dynasty um was rao raja kuman singh his uncle rao raja was called to dinner at the king's palace to stay and look after the state while his highness had other priority and he was subsequently fed with poison at dinner which was a mix of arsenic and cyanine and upon consuming the same he had fallen severely ill and thus rao rani was called by one of the staff members to accompany rao raja and in front of rao rani he was spewing the meat puking out that he was given and without a thought she filled it up in a container and got it back home and uh, subsequently a few days later rao raja had expired and on 21st april 1902 the government of india issued a proclamation announcing that the maharaja of panna madhu singh had been found guilty of having instigated certain persons to poison his uncle and as a result of this finding the maharaja was disposed of all the chiefship of panna deprived of all the rights honors and privileges this is the citation that has been given below it the three brothers seated on the chair is his highness maharaja yadavend singh judev holding his shoulder is the middle born raja raghavend singh judev who had no issues seated on the armrest is from uh, is from where i hail from that's uh, the last born member of rao raja kuman singh who later on went on to become lieutenant colonel is raja bhartin singh judev all three brothers were though referred as maharaja the middle one was called Man- machle maharaj the youngest one was nanne maharaj while his highness remained in the middle the two brothers were given separate jagirs to administer their own financial matters now this is a very interesting tale because otherwise usually the his highness is given all the titles and the other two brothers are removed from the states and part but on this context because their father was murdered they had a very intimate relationship as seen in the photograph um like my great grandfather's nicely seated uh, on the armrest of the his highness and his other brother is holding on to his shoulder they had a very intimate relationship amongst each other always guiding each other and looking after the state while uh, both of them had their separate jagirs and would love to support the brother if the need arise a few years later his highness was blessed with two sons maharaj kumar narain singh and pushpain singh and their property is where the current his highness resides raj mandir palace while nanne was blessed with one the sole heir uh, raj kumar rajin singh judev the sole heir of mohan nawaz palace this is where my grandfather and us are living this is the story of mohan nawaz majle maharaj didn't have any issue but stayed at rani bag uh, the palace of rao raja the royal family of panna with the first and second generation standing from left to right is maharaj kumar narain singh judev then that's majle maharaj his brother uh, his highness's brother raghavend singh judev that's his youngest brother bhartin singh judev and that's maharaj kumar pushpain singh judev who was a renowned polo player rep- represented india and had no issues seated is his 
Highness Maharaj uh, Yadavidev with his nephew, my grandfather Rajkumar Rajendra Singh Jadev. This picture is placed at the drawing room of Mohan Nawaz Panna. Lieutenant Colonel Rajshri Bhartin Singh Jadev, the last son of Raja Kumar Singh, and ICC Dehradun of Home Ministry and Police. While being the youngest, he was also the most travelled amongst the members of the royal family. His travel included that of Italy, Germany, England, where he exchanged ideas, improved the functionality of the state, and also educated his son. Nanne Maharaj was his real sister, who is the His Highness of Rajpipla at the Pyramids of Giza. That's uh, him at Canada Ward, Switzerland. One can see where uh, the Switzerland flag right here, and that's Cadillac V16. This is him in Italy, and this is his fine collection, which is still preserved by the present present family from all over the world. An iconic photograph was where the story of uh, present palace began. Raja Bhartin Singh, with his sister, Her Highness Rajpipla, came across a beautiful castle. The castle was none other than Windsor. And let's go back to the archive to see what Windsor looked like in the early 1900s. This is the Windsor Castle in early 1900s, and this is the construction of Mohan Nawaz Palace uh, from our archive, early 1900. The castle is made up of Panna sandstone, entire stone and attached with lime mix. The turrets are exactly the way it's done to create a Windsor of Central India. Very interesting photograph, Raja Bhartin Singh Judev, the founder, eating sugarcane from his own Jagir, which made this magnificence. Seated next to him is the architect, Shapurji Chandraboy of Shapurji Chandraboy's company, who were one of the best uh, architects in those times. Post completion, he moved in with his wife, Raja Bhartin Singh Judev, with his wife, the daughter of Thakur Ram Nivas Singh Ji, also called Sarkar Saheba. Why was she called Sarkar Saheba is a very interesting story because uh, Raja Bhartin Singh Jadev was a home minister and he was also referred as Sarkar. And um, she was called Sarkar Saheba because they were governing the empire. This is the picture of the drawing room and we still have the same furniture as we can see in the same picture. Sitting is there Rajkumar, my grandfather, Rajkumar Rajin Singh Jadev. To understand where he went for his school, let's have a look at this letter dated 1937, uh, where our great grandfather says, I might inform you that I'm leaving my son and heir with Rajkumar Rajin Singh Jadev under the guardianship of General and Mrs. H.H. H. Henderson of Martins Hall Stebbing near Clemsford, Essex, England. During my absence in India, the said General and Mrs. Henderson will act as my son's guardian either singly or co-jointly. For this reason, I will maintain my current account with you until such time as the Rajkumar remains in England. This is some of his pictures. This Austin 14, Goodwood Saloon. Rajkumar Rajin Singh Jadev. This is British Indian passport from 1937. And he marries uh, my grandmother Rani Saiba of Sultanpur, represented by His Highness Yadwin Singh Judev, and his mother, the Rao Rani Saiba, the mother of all three um, princes. And a daughter was born out of their wedlock, post which Rajkumar Rajin Singh Judev, and their daughter is uh, Divya Rani, my mother. The revival. On the left is His Highness Maharaja Yadwin Singh Judev, on the right is my father, Rajkumar Saheb. Keshav Pratap Singh Jadev, how Mohan Nawaz was revived. Let's have a look at his generation. This is the story of Aramganj Valley. There was a valley of teakwood forest that lies between the states and empires of Ajaygarh and Panna. So this valley was dominated by one man called Thakur Sahib Trilok Singh Jadev, who dominated the valley between two empires. He hails from Prithviraj Johan's dynasty. And what is interesting about him was he was also both the Jagad and His Highness Panna helped, he helped both of them to root out the goons, giving him the title of a, and for a bounty hunter is never without a gun. Let's have a look at his gun. 
The rifle is Malicious Schnauzer, 1923 75 Magnum. This is Thakur Sahib Dilok Singh Judev with my grandfather, paternal Thakur Sahib Bhanu Pratap Singh Judev. Now, very interesting uh, iconic structure built at Nogao. This is the Army Church Nogao. Now, Bundelkhand was the first political agency. And apart from polo and horse riding, what the royals played was uh, uh, in Nogao was a tournament called Nogao Sports Week. For 14 days straight, it conducted tournaments like hockey, table tennis, football, basketball, cricket, etc. The, the Bundelkhand kingdoms all around the place took part in it. There, that was Datia, Orcha, Ajaygar, Bijawar, Jarkhari, Panna. Very interesting story is this is where both my grandfather met for the first time. The Panna state team with both the grandfathers, Rajkumar Rajin Singh Jadev, my maternal and my paternal. I became best friends post that. And uh, they decided to do a, an alliance. So my father fondly remembers talking to his father-in-law then, uh, Rajkumar Rajin Singh Jadev, uh, when he wanted to go for college. And then uh, um, my grandfather said that if you want to go to college, then you must go to St. Stephen's. Then uh, my father was like, okay, Fine, I'll try. And uh, little did he know that he got through it amazingly. This is the picture of Rajkumar Sahib uh, after smashing the 400 meters in Delhi University gold uh, at the Jawaharlal Stadium in Delhi. Uh, representing St. Stephen's, of course. Uh, he was already a natural born athlete, being the, being the grandson of the Teakwood Empire businessman who roamed around in the Ajaygarh Valley. So his pastime used to be, let's go climb this mountain, let's go climb that mountain, which made him a classic athlete, smashing um, records. And his record still stands in Delhi College of 400 meter and 200 meter. And my father is currently 55 years old. This is him at his wedding, um, the alliance to revive. Thakur Sahib Bhanu Pratap Singh Judev with his, with the His Highness Narain Singh Judev representing the brother Rajkumar. Rajin Singh Judev, who had expired before the marriage in 1982. Marriage ceremony was commenced in 1988. This is the Rajkumar Sahib with his Delhi University friend, His Highness Panna representing his brother. Left to right, at present, my uncle Sujay Kishore is a senior officer in Air India. That's my father. That's uh, Pradeep Kumar Singh, who's the senior officer in Indian Railways. That's my other uncle, Deepak Sharma who's a chartered accountant and, and a CEO of a renowned company. This is the His Highness representing his brother, Rajkumar Rajan Singh Dev. And an alliance was made. Uh, so very interesting thing is that in my family, we go with three H. That we honor the past, we remain humble in the present, and we work hard towards the future. So an alliance was made to revive, protect, and preserve the, these th three things. And of course, Mohan Nivas Palace. The present family of Mohan Nivas Palace so both my sisters are doctors, whereas I'm a lawyer trying to follow my father's footsteps. Both my sisters, really what they contribute to the society is uh, that despite having a great education, they decide to come and stay in Panna. And uh, my sister, my eldest sister runs the PHC um, private health clinic in Panna. My middle sister is a COVID warrior. Both of them are COVID warriors. And we're all hoping to host you soon. The other contribution to the society is we flagged off the tri tri travels to my elephant, which is a race across India to save Asia's last remaining elephants from extinction in 2017. We did the flagging off. This is the whole family. The celebrities which attended the event were Pillar Boxford, Ben Elliott, Poonam and Puneet Gupta, Varis Aluwalia, Aisha Shand, Fardad and Mehdad, and many others. Gudosi, Tom Parker Bowles, and others. The other contribution that they do is they adopt and look after malnourished children, my parents. Divirani and Kesha Raja Ji has conducted free treatment with the help of Pranami Sampradaya, an organization which looks after the people of Panna, and it's also connected to a religious sect. Apart from that, uh, people have, he's, they have adopted 400 kids to look after their malnourishment, monitoring their diets. And um, they also teach the people of Panna the, rain, the benefits of rainwater harvesting, organic farming, the beautiful city needs to conserve its wildlife, so wildlife conservation. 
and they were one of the lead roles in Tiger Relocation Project in Panna. This is the east view of Mohanyamas Palace. This is the west view of Mohanyamas Palace. This is the south view of Mohanyamas Palace. And this is some of the teasers. What we have, uh, if a guest decides to just stay on campus, we, what we have is our organic farms. Two water bodies which the guests can enjoy for fishing. And it's vast campus, which were created by my father. And uh, now let's just have a look at this video. This is a night view of Mohanyamas Palace. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Preeti Raj. This was a lovely treat. And hold on. Of course, we all want to go to Panna now to look for diamonds. <laughs> Sounds really fun. I've never heard of something like this. And again, I think it's really wonderful to hear these uh, personal stories of the privately owned, the family owned and historic houses of India and the important contribution these families make, not only in preserving um, the heritage, but also the many other ways they contribute to society, from wildlife um, to organic farming, um, to uh, looking after children. This is really, really wonderful to see. Um, there were a few questions. Uh, one, one question was, um, uh, do you know where the name Panna comes from? Um, the name Panna comes from the, the forest surrounding it which literally translates into Hindi as emerald. So the green, greenery that surrounds Panna is the forest and therefore the name Panna. This is really rather poetic because, you know, it is the place also of the diamond mine, but actually the emerald, the jewel is actually nature. It is just the a forest is I really the emerald, Panna forest. Yeah. Of course, um, you know, the Center for Historic Houses is very interested in the history of uh, buildings and families and their collections, but is also interested in the present and in the future. So maybe you can share a little bit about um, what you want to do. I mean, you, I know your family is involved in so many things, you know, as I just uh, mentioned and you explained in great detail. Um, how about uh, the historic house and heritage and to see people who want to come looking at the fantastic um, architecture right of Bundelkhand um, and Kajurao is there um, Orcha is about three hours away um, so it is really um, a, a, it would be a wonderful opportunity and we are all really waiting uh, for uh, um, you know a vaccine or something so that, that we'll be able to visit all of these wonderful places um, yes, we'll be opening really soon in the coming year and um, uh, the location of Panna is uh, and especially Mohanewas is very close to Kajurao it's just 35 minutes drive so one can just take a hop and flight from Khajraho and 35 minutes drive through the beautiful reserve forest and straight into the Windsor of central India. And so uh, Panna, the city, uh, the, the town of Panna, how far away do you live from this town and um, what is there to look at? I'm, uh, uh, the town Panna itself is right close to us. Initially, it was built a little f further away, but uh, you know, Society grew and now we are placed right in the center of it called Civil Lines. So there's, the town is just five minutes drive from there. Bada Bazaar is 10 minutes. Oh, per I feet of Panna. But the estate is really vast. I think, you know, about 50 acres of land around this, um, around the, um, around the property. Yes. Um, I think we, um, <laughs> we lost you. I'm back in a minute. In the meantime, um, I'm looking at some more questions. I'm also inviting the, um, the audience, the visitors to um, ask some more questions. <laughs> Thank you for the birthday wishes, but the birthday is on the 30th of September. <laughs> Thank you. <Lou. laughs> um, Preeti Raj, would you like to um, say anything? Also, you know, actually, I, I, should, I should have mentioned that Preeti Raj was a former student of mine in one class. Yes, I would um, really like to thank Center for Historic Housing. And um, <laughs> like, apart from me being turned out to, uh, as a lawyer, 
what I really enjoyed was meeting the professor and her classes and the talk about revival of um, heritage and her contribution to little things and which has become so big now that uh, they, like every castle in India is on the world map. Thanks to the professor. Thank you very much. This is very kind of you, Preeti Raj. I mean, of course, you know, the center would love to stay in touch. We would love to collaborate in, in, in any way, you know, working on projects together in the future. And of course, there will be Palace Day next year. So by then, hopefully the pandemic will be gone. So we can do actually some live, you know, events on Palace Day on the 19th of July. It's a date not, uh, nobody will ever forget again. Hmm? So, um, yes, uh, thank you very much. There was just one comment, and I'm so glad you mentioned this. Um, you know, the comment is it, uh, from um, Shata Visha, uh, a truly cosmopolitan culture. Thank you for the amazing presentation. I agree. I think, um, you know, what we see, um, as I said, I find there is too much focus on politics, you know, the, um, and, and government styles. When I think of princely India, when I think of um, the erstwhile royal families, I think of all the culture that is associated with these families. And that is so wonderful. I'm thinking of all the grace, uh, the beauty, um, and, um, and I think, you know, a lot of it is kind of lost and we must make sure that we also preserve this beautiful culture because, you know, these families have been patrons of the arts, um, of architecture, uh, so many associated creative industries. It is important to not only preserve this, but to revive this and to have this beautiful, vibrant culture, which is so much part of India. And we should not forget about this. So um, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, if there's one more question, uh, we could take one more. And otherwise, I would like to announce our next um, events. Um, actually, <laughs> we wanted to kind of have only two events um, um, because term has already started. But there are so many fascinating talks, I just couldn't say no. So next Friday, we'll have um, Gwalior and the um, erstwhile royal family of Gwalior and their beautiful palace and museum. And um, afterwards, on the 18th um, of September, we have a very special talk featuring um, the royal family of Neva in the beautiful Lake Palace. And uh, this is very special because we will have Dipti Kara, who's a wonderful art historian, um, originally from India, but now in New York. And her um, book is forthcoming with Princeton University Press in September, the end of September, uh, about 18th century paintings in, in, in Neva, in, in Udaipur. And we'll also have um, the manager, uh, Mohan, from Taj. So we really have a very good view of the royal family of, uh, of Meva and their kind of account of the family and history. We have the manager of Taj and we have this uh, wonderful, talented um, young art historian um, from, um, from New York. And finally, on the 25th of September, we'll have um, the erstwhile royal family of Kaputala, which is very exciting, again, with another European connection. And um, so please, you know, if you have any wishes from the audience or so, um, or if you are the owner of, of a historic house, please write to us. Uh, we would love to hear from you. We are there for you. Um, we would um, you know, always like to collaborate and, and help you out in any way we can. Um, there's a question. Uh, yeah. Yes. What drove me away from the fast, fast paced life that usually attract people away from their roots? So, um, thanks to the pandemic and apart from having a fast paced life, I think I wasn't really built for Delhi. I would just say that out loud. Um, what I really enjoyed was, uh, waking up to beautiful sunrises, sunsets and being extremely close to nature. And while just running from different courts and, you know, like staying up late nights, drafting petitions, waking up early in the morning, representing my clients, I realized that, um, uh, I don't think so that I want to grow old while doing this. So I decided one month before lockdown. Now, this is just not because of lockdown that I'm back. It's because one month before of lockdown where I got back and I realized this is the place that I want to be. I want to revive the culture, the artistry and all. And um, then I went after my parents and my grandmother and my grandparents and everyone that I need the old photographs and I need to know what is where we are. And, um, and thank you so much, Professor, for a wonderful opportunity like Palace Day and uh, Center for Historic Housing and Thank of course Jindal University which really gave me a platform. 
wonderful. Thank you, Raj. I'm so sorry. I just heard it is your birthday today. Oh, uh, I that. this is so wonderful. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. What a wonderful occasion. I wish I'd known that. I didn't know. You know, I wish you all the best. A very, very special new year. And of course, maybe you want to follow your, your family's footsteps and also kind of, you know, travel. Bring beautiful souvenirs back again. <laughs> to Pana. I'm not saying that you should build another palace, but maybe something else, you know. Any idea? Because I think, you know, as a European, being in India, and India is my home, um, you know, I love the encounter of culture. And again, this is something that I feel very, very strongly about. We should um, accentuate the positive parts because people have always loved to travel. People have always had curiosity about other uh, cultures. And we don't only need to, you know, do the bashing and focus on the negative, but we need to actually build a sustainable future, um, you know, which is uh, in a conciliatory way where people work together, you know, and from all over the world. And heritage is a kind of globally shared phenomenon. And this is also something why Palestine made me really happy because it is this also togetherness between um, um, Asia and, and Europe um, and that we actually work together and that the palaces are there all over the world and coming together. This is important. Um, we, we want to accentuate the local, but we also think kind of globally. This is um, in, in, in a positive way. That's what I want to accentuate. So... <laughs> Thank you very much and happy birthday to you. Thank, thank you so much, Professor. It was lovely having everyone over. Thank, thank you for coming. Bye bye.